Brilliant. I couldn't hear that. It was all breaking up. Can you hear me better now? We can hear you beautifully. Oh, good. I can hear you. <laughs> well, then this is a good beginning. Um, I'm going to uh, build on that, that hearing each other as an introduction for this conversation that we can be listening and learning together. We're all just so thrilled and excited to have a little time this morning with Dr. Jane Goodall. I'm going to give the briefest introduction to someone who it represents a lifetime of embodied uh, achievement and inspiration for us. Dr. Jane Goodall, of course, is founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and a UN messenger of peace. And she is a world-renowned ethologist and activist, inspiring really all of us in having a greater understanding of our relationship with each other, as well as the rest of the animal kingdom. And while Dr. Goodall is known for her green groundbreaking studies of wild chimpanzees in the Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania. Uh, she has forever changed our understanding of who we are as humans and how we connect with our natural world. We're gonna talk a bit about that today because uh, Jane's transformative work continues to build on scientific innovations, and a lifetime of advocacy that continues to trailblaze in ways that we all need to embrace and support the community-led cons conservation, uh, animal welfare, science, and youth empowerment efforts through the Jane Goodall Institute's Roots and Shoots program. So we're gonna look forward to uh, hearing more about that. Uh, uh, Jane, you have a reputation of traveling 300 days a year. It's exhausting just to think about that, but it's also energizing and important for us to follow you and your example, uh, even during COVID, launching Virtual Jane and continuing now with the podcast, Jane Goodall Hopecast. We welcome and we thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you very much. And I'm really happy to be with you. So I want to begin with where we are right now in the world. Uh, the state of the world is calling for us and calling on us to stand up, stand together, stand with you and with each other as we face crises of climate change and uh, the loss of biodiversity. In looking at the state of the world and your insights and experience, Speak to us about cooperation, collaboration, and the most urgent paths available to us to make a difference today. Well, let me start off by saying, indeed, we are in a bad place. I mean, politically, socially, and so much so environmentally. And, you know, I, I sort of see humanity as at the mouth of a very long, very dark tunnel. And right at the end of that tunnel is a little star, and that's hope. But it's no good sitting at the mouth of the tunnel and hoping that the star will come to us. No, we have to roll up our sleeves and we have to climb over, crawl under, work around all the obstacles that lie between us and the star. And that's climate change, loss of biodiversity, um, industrial agriculture that is destroying the very soil on which we depend and causing terrible loss of biodiversity. A poverty, people living in poverty will destroy the environment simply to survive. And I could go on and on, but, but you, and I'm sure the listeners know all the problems that we face. So the good news is that every single one of these problems has a little group of people or several groups fighting to find solutions. But unfortunately, so many people are in silos. And so they may solve their particular problem. But if they're not looking at the whole picture, then they, they don't realize they may be causing problems somewhere else. So a simple example, yay, we've closed down this coal mine. All those emissions of CO2 saved from going into the environment, into the greenhouse gases. But, oh my goodness, we never thought 
there's a tremendous loss of jobs, people plunged into poverty, but there are people who are specializing in training people whose industries have collapsed into alternative ways of making a living. So if that had been thought of at first, then the second lot of problems might not have arisen. So thank you for that. And for that, that hopeful image of the star shining at the end of the tunnel, but also the critical reminder and, and call to action that none of us do this alone, but all of us are needed. So when we, with the example you give, uh, uh, may solve one problem, if we do it in silo and isolation, we miss the unintended consequences. That's why we need each other. So with that uh, insight and imperative, um, can you tell us a bit more about the community-led conservation efforts? Why is it so important that it be community-led? And what does that mean in, in your work that we can be learning from and supporting? Okay, well, when I realized that chimp numbers were disappearing, and forests were being cut down at a terrifying rate across Africa, I knew I had to try and do something about it. And I visited the chimp study sites and learned a lot about the problems facing the chimps. But I also learned about the, the plight of so many of the African people living in and around the forests. And it was crippling poverty, lack of good health and education, degradation of the land as populations grew, and they moved further and further into wildlife habitat, risking disease. And when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park, where we're in our 63rd year of studying chimps, um, when, I, when I began in 1960, it was part of a great forest belt. By the late 1980s, I looked at a little tiny island of forest that was Gombe, surrounded by bare hills. More people living there than the land could support too poor to buy food elsewhere, land mm -hmm. fertile and overused. And it hit me, if we don't help these people find ways of making a living without destroying the environment, we can't save chimps, forests, or anything else. And so we began this program, Take Care or Takari, and it's very <clears throat> holistic, but it includes not just restoring fertility to the overused farmland without pesticides and herbicides and other horrible chemicals, but uh, scholarships to give girls a chance of secondary education. And it's been shown all around the world as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. And we provide family planning information and we do water management programs, land use management programs. It's worked so very well. The people now understand conserving the environment isn't just for wildlife, it's their own future. And that program is now in a total of seven African countries. Which is amazing. And it, and it really speaks to the, the critical strategy of um, recognizing how interconnected we all are. The interconnectedness of this, this ecosystem in which we're a part. We too often separate out us and then nature as if we're somehow not natural beings. Uh, and I, I wanna ask you more about that interconnected ecosystem, um, how we can learn from different kinds of intelligences, how we can uh, share that, that, that knowledge and the role that, uh, that, that you, you speak of that Roots and Shoots has played and that we might be able to support. I appreciate in particular calling out the way that it works. It works when we are taking into uh, consideration land use, land ownership, the people's needs, the role that women and girls play. I thank you for my daughters and my son and the inspiration that that, that, that gives us. But tell us more about where your vision for Roots and Shoots is going and how we can support that. Okay, well, let, let me back off a tiny bit to say, um, yes, the interconnection part is so very important. And, you know, as you say, we're part of the natural world. The thing is we depend on it for food, air, water, everything, but we depend on healthy ecosystems. 
And an ecosystem is this complex mix of plants and animals, and each one has a role to play. So as one after the other, they disappear, so the ecosystem will collapse. And, you know, when I was traveling around trying to raise money for our Takari program, I was meeting young people back in the 80s who were already losing hope, and they were angry, depressed, or mostly just apathetic. So I asked them, why do you feel like that? Well, you've compromised our future, and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, we've been stealing their future since the Industrial Revolution. But was it true there was nothing they could do? No, I firmly believe there's a window of time. And if we get together and take action, it's not too late to slow down climate change and loss of biodiversity. So Roots and Shoots began with 12 high school students in Tanzania. It's now in six, over 65 countries. We've got members in kindergarten, university, even some adults and everything in between. And because of this interrelationship, each group chooses a project to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And I think that, well, its main message is every single one of us makes an impact every single day. And out of this, when we try and bring them together from different countries, usually virtually, they come to understand that much more important than the color of our skin, our language, our nationality, even our religion, is the fact we're all human beings. We all laugh, we cry, our blood is the same. We're a family. And so Roots and Shoots, these young people, I cannot begin to tell you how much hope they give me. Because when they understand the problem and they are empowered to take action, it's all about working out your own choice of problem. We don't tell them what to do. They choose. And then they roll up their sleeves and they take action on the plan they've devised. And they are changing the world as we speak. What an amazing, uh, not only legacy, but forecast for how, for how we move forward. When I was talking with people here at uh, the Opal Gathering for Family Offices in Newport, in anticipation of this conversation, people said, well, ask Jane where there's hope. What is the way forward? What's the path? And this is one of the great ways that we can join you in a path through that, that tunnel towards, uh, towards the star. Um, you, you speak of the importance of um, everyone making a difference and finding their way and their role. And that, that brings me to the importance of, um, uh, of community-led, not only conservation, but activism uh, and how we come into our uh, partnerships in a way that builds trustworthiness. There's been such a, um, uh, an assault on our, our, our trust and our sense of hope and how we work together. I'd like to invite you to share with us how we can work with you and how uh, uh, you see partnerships as being successful. What are the key elements? I'm reminded of your uh, early work trying to gain the trust of the chimps you were working with and learning we needed to meet them where they are. How do we do that, learn from that now with each other? Well, I think the first thing, obviously, for a successful partnership is a shared vision. And to some extent, a shared mission, although these can be a little bit different, but pointing in the same direction. And then you've mentioned it, trust. Trust and transparency. Because as you say, we are fed so many lies, this fake news. It, it's just horrifying. And that's why, you know, one of the things that's really important isn't just alleviating poverty, but it's alleviating ignorance. We need really good education, not just for girls, for boys as well. And we need to throw light on the darkness that's being created by all this fake news. And it, it's, it's very hard. I mean, if young people are told by people they've been brought up to respect that things are so, well, of course, they're going to believe that. So how do we change that? That's a difficult question to answer. 
Do you have any idea about that? Yes. <laughs> well, one of the ways I think we, uh, we can build and rebuild trust that you embody is to uh, be trustworthy and to establish trustworthiness. And that comes from transparency and authenticity and sharing our creativity. You mentioned the, the central importance of having a vision, establishing articulated vision, sharing that vision. One way that we share that is through our creative expression, through our work, our relationships, our actions, our choices, our investments, uh, our philanthropy, and, and storytelling. So I have, I have a, a share and tell here. <laughs> so I, I brought a, well, my, a copy from my children's bookshelf of this beautiful book that Jane read, uh, wrote uh, that my mother gave me to read to our kids. And we did, Eagle and the Wren. And it's a beautiful fable uh, that I, I, I wanted to um, uh, share here as a way that we can take an, an example of um, building and rebuilding hope and trustworthiness. I think, uh, so I'd love to hear more about what you see as the role of storytelling in general in all its forms, and then in particular with the arts and creative expression in magnifying the, the light from that star at the end of the tunnel. Well, you, I mean, storytelling for me is the way to go because if you're, for example, confronting someone who's a climate change denier or something like that, it's not much use arguing with them because they're not going to listen. They've got their opinion and they don't want to change. So I try and spend a few moments trying to get a feeling for who I'm talking to. And if there's something in common, maybe we both love dogs, maybe, I don't know, something. So then in your storehouse of memories, pull out a story because the way for, to change people is to reach the heart. And we need head and heart working in harmony to attain our true human potential. And you know, even if the person doesn't seem to change, you planted a seed in the heart and people have to change from within. They're not going to be battered into believing. Something's got to reach in there. And that's how people change. Beautiful. Uh, and uh, I think we all aspire towards that. And one of the things that's so powerful about that message is that we all have that heart. We all have that capability, that potential. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask more personally, what sustains your magnificent heart in this work? What keeps you going uh, and energizes you to keep inspiring all of us? Well, for one thing, um, I, I'm quarter Dutch and they're known to be very obstinate. So I'm, I'm not going to be, <laughs> so, but, but also it's passion. I mean, I care, I care about the environment. I care about animals. I care about my own grandchildren and theirs and everybody else's. I just love children and, you know, I, I care so much about the animals out there and the dogs and the cats. And I think all the time of the animals that we put in these terrible factory farms, that each one has a personality and each one is capable of feeling um, bewilderment and fear. They all feel pain, every single one of them. And so it's these kind of things that bother me and keep me awake at night and just make me determined to keep on fighting and fighting alone is no good so reaching out forming partnerships um realizing that nature is really resilient given a chance and places we've destroyed can once again become green and beautiful and animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance and children who are just in deep depression once they join something like Roots and Shoots, their lives change. They tell me almost every day. So because of that, I have to go on. There's, there's no way I can stop. And it may sound kind of corny and weird and whatever, but I just feel I was put on this planet with a mission and there's nothing I can do but 
follow that star. We're grateful that you that you are and that you do that. And uh, of course, you were put on uh, uh, this this earth at this time when we need you most uh, to uh, be following that star. I, I truly believe in uh, your your vision that all of us are here with a mission. All of us are here to speak from our heart and connect with each other and move our resources, our spheres of influence to the best of our capacity to make this world a better place. The trick is figuring out where we fit in and uh, 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 how and when to answer that call. But, but our world is calling for us all the time. Uh, and we're very blessed and uh, grateful that, that you have been able to answer that um, so powerfully. Uh, I, I wanna ask like, also about um, what you uh, described in uh, your uh, experience walking through forests, encountering a, a sense of wonder and this spiritual power or closeness to it. Uh, uh, that's also something that is so critical uh, for us to remember and learn from in preparing for our time together today. I, I visualized taking a long walk with you in the forest. So thank you for that this morning. Um, but tell us what that gives you and how we might learn from that walking through our own paths in forests and what we need to do to make sure those environments are sustained. Well, you know, for me being alone, being alone in the forest, if you're with somebody, even somebody you love, then it's two people in nature. If it's just you, you're part of nature and you, the ego isn't there. You're just part of this whole mm -hmm. beautiful, glorious, interconnected uh, forest world. And I do feel a great peace, a sense of wonder and a connection with a great spiritual power. And for me, it gives me strength. And so it's now been proved that especially small children need nature for their healthy psychological development. And you know that in Japan and Canada, maybe other countries too, I don't know, doctors can actually prescribe time in nature for mentally uh, disturbed people. And it, it's calming, just like the presence of a dog or other animal is also calming and healing and works wonders. And you know, we are part of this natural world and more and more today in our busy lives, people in the middle of the city, as you said earlier, they are increasingly divorced from the natural world. And this is an absolute tragedy. So Roots and Shoots, we really encourage people to get out in nature. And if we can't take children in an inner city for example into the country because because of the insurance you have to pay to get a bus it's, it's inhibitive um, take nature into the schoolroom take plants um, the wonder on a child's face when they've tended a bulb and they see it suddenly blossoming or they see a caterpillar hatching into a butterfly you know things like that the wonder and if children don't learn to understand and love nature, they're not going to want to protect it. Well, thank you so much for this time. I'm just uh, uh, absorbing and, and grateful for, uh, for this moment. I know we're all so inspired, not only to honor your example, but find our own paths through that tunnel towards the star, uh, recognizing that we each have our own paths to take. We're not alone and uh, we can support and connect with each other. I do wanna thank and acknowledge your colleague who's actually in the room today, uh, uh, Dan Kemp, who is over here. So folks who want to engage uh, after this time with Dr. Goodall in Roots and Shoots or the Jane Goodall Institute, please see him. And uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, finish with um, uh, uh, a, a moment of uh, gratitude and recognition as the Talmud teaches us that the work is great and the time is short. 
and we are not required to complete the task, nor are we free to desist from doing it. We're all in this together, and we're so grateful to be doing this work together with you. Thank you for the time together this morning. No, thank you as well. Thank you. <laughs> so I think um, we're going to wrap up there and uh, I'll invite Dan back to the stage. Jane, thank you so much for this time. Thank you everyone for being here. Final remarks. Oh, I've been given an extra moment. Uh, Jane, uh, any final remarks, please. Uh, uh, let's take a few more moments uh, with you. Well, honestly, I think the most important message is what I've already said, that each single one of us uh, can make a difference every day, and we can choose what sort of difference we make. And it will be different for different people. Some people can make a huge difference. But if we think about our environmental footprint, and we try to behave decently to other people, and to you know animals and nature to show respect 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 then we move towards a better world respect 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 uh thank you thank you thank you yes <laughs> so, so please